imagine the prodigal returning to a grumpy father. <laughs> Sitting there and he, him and his other son, you know, they kept note. How many days? How much money did he spend, you think? How did he spend it, you think? There is only one father, remember. But there's another one called the father of lies. But there's only one father that matters. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You've seen me. You've seen the father. Anything that you thought you knew about God that is unlike Jesus is not God. I don't care how many scriptures you can quote. But I've known Lydia for 37 years. If someone would come to me and tell me something that I know is not her, that's not a character. Even if they come with a fake signature. I know her. Jesus didn't come to win religious debates about the Sabbath. Because he is the Sabbath. And my father is working still. He's working in your favor. To unveil your understanding. The truth about you. And you know what's so beautiful about the truth? It brings freedom. You cannot buy freedom. You cannot buy freedom. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure. Where does the treasure get its value from? Not from our market values, measured by our performance. We're talking the authentic, the original. The original. The one who says before Abraham was, I am. I am. He's not hiding in history. Neither is he hiding in outer space. Neither is he hiding somewhere in the unknown future. He is. I am. In you. If that wasn't gospel, then Paul wasted his time in Acts 17 with those Greek philosophers. Maybe he just wanted them to feel good. All he did was he pointed them in the right direction. He says, you're very autistic, but you're busy with the wrong idea of God. You're trying to manufacture God according to your pattern of thinking. <laughs> he says, but you know what, Aratus, Aratus wrote 300 BC, Greek philosopher. In him, we live and move and have our being. We are indeed his offspring. So Paul says, come on guys, if you are his offspring, don't try and carve a beautiful bird or a monkey out of a piece of wood and make that deity. What an insult to his image in you. He says, God is not far from each one of us. There can no longer be a you and us or a them and us conversation. He's not far from each one of us. He's not closer to the Jew. Even the son of Benjamin doesn't have some special claim on the blessings of God. Don't waste your time traveling to Jerusalem. There's no greater blessing there than what there is in Tracy. Because the hour has come. We're not talking good predictions here. We're talking good news. The hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. The very glory that we lost in Adam was redeemed in him. We're talking redemption. Because if, there's a, if there is a treasure hidden in the agricultural field, what logic is there? But to know that there is more to you than what meets the eye. There is a treasure in the earthen vessel. The earthen vessel carries much more value than its cosmetics. Amen. How to jump from it, how to dress it, how to comb it hair, to make it presentable to society. I no longer know any man after the flesh. You can look as good as you want to look, that's great. But your real value is your innermost being. Hallelujah. Amen. There's more to the field. 
than what meets the eye. <laughs> the man who finds the treasure. Here's the good news. This is still Matthew 13, verse 44. And what does this man do? He hides it again. To do what with it? To go and redeem its original value. You don't bargain with the devil. You don't ever bargain with a thief. Because a thief never takes ownership. The earth is still the Lord's. Yeah. And the fullness there. Yeah. The world and those who dwell in it. Yeah. What did the man do? He sold all that he had. You want to begin to understand the value of the individual? The value of one man? The currencies of this world cannot redeem one soul. Amen. But by the priceless blood of Christ, you were bought at the price. You were bought at the price. You were already His, but He redeemed you again. He redeemed you again to reveal your original value. Colossians 1 and verse 6. This word resonates within you and its appeal is prevailing in the whole world. The harvest is evident everywhere and gaining ground. Remember what God said? To the increase of His government and His peace. There shall be no end. No end. And how will God do this? He says, and the zeal of the Lord will do this. What's the difference between the zeal of the Lord and Romans 10? Paul says, I bear them Jews wings. I was there myself. They have a zeal for God. But it's not enlightened. Why is it, why is it not enlightened? Because they're too busy working out their own righteousness. And in their efforts, they feel justified. Just like Israel. They felt justified to get delayed in a 40 year long wilderness. They thought, well, you know, maybe God needed this wilderness. You know that the wilderness was not Israel's destiny. Neither was it their journey. They landed there because of their own unbelief. What was their unbelief about? Believing a lie about themselves. And the God of this world does what? He veils the minds of the unbeliever to confirm the unbelief. The harvest is evident everywhere in any ground. But yes, I was saying, what's the difference between the zeal of the Lord of hosts? The gaining ground zeal. Not the us for a no more and please rapture me, Jesus. I mean, Jesus killed that by saying one thing when he prayed. He says, Father, I do not pray that you take them out of the world. So if you have plans to depart too soon, cancel those plans. Paul says, I've heard him witness that they have a seal for God. Remember what Isaiah says? The seal of the Lord. What's the difference then? The one occupies all your energy, all your time, labor, oh, try and work your own salvation, your own righteousness. All along it was God working in you, both the world and the world. Paul says, not only my presence, but much more in my absence. We planned a tour, maybe a three-week trip to America. This is our sixth week. If you get my brother Leon here, he goes to Siberia for two weeks. He comes back two months later. Paul says it's unenlightened zeal. Unenlightened zeal is the most dangerous life you can live. Doesn't matter how much money you give to the church, how hard you work at it. There's only one light that enlightens every man. It's the light of the gospel. What does the light of the gospel reveal? The original value of the treasure. 
It's from David again. It's from David again. You don't have to do anything to impress God. He's already impressed. He's mindful of you. Jesus did not die because of the sorry state of the human race. God did not send Jesus to the cross because of his pity for the human race. He redeemed the original value. He redeemed the treasure in you. Great is the mystery. What is the mystery then? It was hidden for ages and generations. Hidden from whom? From the enemy. So that none of the rulers of this world could understand the foolishness of the cross. Why would God take such insult? Why would the cross be so powerful? Because God redeemed your original value. Not from the devil. From your own understanding. Because he desires to show more convincingly to you. Heir of the promise. What has it helped already the heir? I'm still trying to gain favor with God. I'm still trying to gain a better standing. So what did God do? He interposed with an oath. He swore by himself. Many did swear by greater than themselves to bring an end to all the spirit. The moment we tap into this gospel, we understand what Paul meant when he said to Titus, avoid quarreling. No dispute is this zone where we live in. No dispute. Because we're dealing with God's persuasion. And God revealed His persuasion concerning us in Christ. You know what the difference is between the two zeals? The one exhausts, the other ignites. So Paul's just writing here about his dear co-worker Epaphras. He is passionate about your well-being in Christ. He told us how much you love us in the Spirit. I want to tell you that Lydia and I have never been more overwhelmed in all our lives with love. I remember the first time we Skyped with Rod and Aileen. Aileen popped up there in the Skype page and she said, Francis, do you have any idea how many people love you if you're in a minute? We have no idea. We've been totally loved. And so it says in verse 9, and so we have become inseparably linked to you. You see, we're talking an inseparable union here. Not because we're trying to make a good impression so that we can connect with some wonderful people. Because we discovered that we are so connected already. Remember, we're not inviting Jesus into our hearts, into our fellowship. He's inviting us into the only valid fellowship between the Father and the Son. We are invited into His fellowship. And so we've become inseparably linked to you. Our constant desire for you is that you might be overwhelmed with the knowledge of God's dream for your lives. The problem is we dream too small. Because we measure our dreams by our works, our gifts, our talents. You may be beautifully gifted, but your gift does not define you. His dream is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask or think. What was our problem then? Our thoughts were not His thoughts, therefore our ways were not His ways. They were higher, but they're no longer any higher. Because in the meantime, the snow and the rain came and cancelled the distance and shook the soil and awakened the incorruptible seed, the treasure. Thorn tree dry days are over. Briars are over. Cypress 
fir trees, myrtle trees, oaks of righteousness. That you might be overwhelmed with the knowledge of God's dream for your lives. We pray that the pattern of His wisdom and thoughts will fall into place for you. Sunni Amy, that spiritual understanding, the Greek word means joining together as of two streams, a fusion of thought. I'm just reading to you quickly, I'm just skipping because if we're going to... Verse 11, Colossians 1, you're empowered in the dynamic of God's strength. His mind is made up about you. He enables you to be strong in endurance and steadfastness with joy. Those are grateful to the Father qualified us to participate in the allotted portion of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He rescued us from the claim of darkness and ignorance and transferred us into the kingdom where the love of His Son rules. In God's mind, mankind is associated in Christ. In His blood sacrifice, we were ransomed. Our redemption was secured. Our sins were completely done away with. In Him, verse 15, the invisible God is made visible again in order that everyone may recognize their true origin in Him. He is the firstborn of every creature. Everything that is begins in Him, whether in the heavenly realm or upon the earth, visible or invisible. Every order of justice and every level of authority, be it kingdoms or governments, principalities or jurisdictions, all were created by Him and for Him. He is the initiator of all things. Therefore, everything finds its relevance yeah. and it's through pattern only in him yeah. the law came through Moses Christ and truth came through Jesus yeah. darkness shall cover the earth and thick darkness we would want the prophet to say run and hide yeah. <laughs> this is what the rise and shine yeah. for your light has come yeah. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. And the nations shall come to your light. And the kings to the brightness of your rising. You are the light of the world. Stop pointing people to an invisible historic Jesus. You are his body. God cannot be more visible than what he is in you. God has found the face. In your, in your games, in your mouth, in your heart, in your head, in your feet. God cannot be more global and more mobile than what He already is in the living, personal, known and read by all men. The Ecclesia is the visible expression, the body, of which Jesus is the head. He is the principal rank of authority who leads the triumphant procession of our new birth out of the region of the dead. His preeminent rank is beyond threat. I like the message translation. It says here he's leading the resurrection parade. I see you guys are getting in a hurry. I'm almost through. Can I give you one more verse here? Verse 19. Listen to verse 19. It's all you hear tonight. Just listen to this. The full measure of everything God has in mind for man indwells him. The message says, so spacious is he, so roomy, that everything of God finds its proper place in him. Without crowding. If we can create little spaces that we measure by gigabytes, do not underestimate you. You have 75 trillion cells in your body. Some of us may be. And God wrote the script of every DNA. Three billion characters. It will take you 96 years if you were to count one strand of, of DNA characters and one character per second. Awesome. Fearfully made. Image bearers. 
Who's in sculpture? Whose likeness do you bear? Whose image do you bear? Living God. He came to reveal and to redeem his image and his likeness in men. You can go and read the Colossians rest of it. I just so thank God that he engaged us in a conversation beyond Facebook, beyond Skype, beyond email, beyond on or offline. We are dealing with Emmanuel. I am the father we are one. And so are you. And we're dealing with the most stubborn God. <laughs> he says, before you sought me, I said, here I am. Oh, <laughs> and if you didn't get it, I said again, here I am. I'm so glad that Jesus appeared twice. In his wonderful 33 years on this planet in a single grain of wheat, a single human body. But he appeared again in the rich harvest, the resurrected, new life, new creation. You are my body. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Amen. Yeah, we are. It's within you. It's within you. It's within you. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. God cannot get to man and what he did in the world was made flesh what God now has in you is gift wrapped to the scroll is a little thing what a day to be alive they have no distance, no delay. How oh, is You are God's moment. Arise, shine, for your light is coming. You drink from me? How do we drink from you again, Jesus? You believe that the whole book's all about me. You'll discover that I'm all about you. You are what Jesus is all about. And what happens then, Jesus? Rivers of living water will gush out of your innermost being. You never need to ask God to enter over the heavens. All is down the revival. And the revival is inside of you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't do it. But one sacrifice. Once and for all. Took away the sin consciousness of this world. We redeemed our innocence. We're embraced. Everybody can take this. As my wife showed you, we've got it for the right to Santa Cruz. This is a right brother. I forgot. We are going to do something covenants right now. And I'm so glad that I get an opportunity to say something about this covenant right now. Jesus said, as often as you do this, as often as you do what? Every time you open your mouth to eat or to drink, what do you do? You celebrate the incarnation. Those pork ribs you ate yesterday, they walk and talk today in you. The two men on their way to Emmaus, they saw nothing, but their hearts began to burn. They didn't even recognize Jesus. What an opportunity to get an autograph. <laughs> they recognize him. Because their minds are so cluttered with their own theology. 
They were hoping for a political Jesus and at least start the Christian party. But he goes and dies on them. And he's not just risen, he's walking with them. He's opening the scriptures. So he's pointing them to what Moses said about him. What the prophets said about him. What the, day, what the psalmist sang about him. And their hearts began to burn. Luke interviews the two of them and he gets to the point where they arrive at their address. And Luke is so inquisitive that he writes, it appeared that he was going further. And instead of them saying their polite goodbyes, and instead of Jesus seeing this great opportunity to make an altar call now, at least bring this thing to closure, <laughs> it appears that he's going. What did they do? They constrained him. They said, Lord, stay with us. And he went into the house and he sat around the table. And he took the bread and he broke it. And their eyes were opened. What did they see? They see the true bread. The only bread that will satisfy them. Not their own labor. Not their own harvest. But the one that is already ripe. Present. In three days, God rebuilt the human body as his only address. We are raised together with him. This meal is just a little pointer to the greatest reality that you can ever participate in. Unbroken union with God and with one another. God bless you. Let's come and have 